Chapter 18, Section 46 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Friday, the 5th of October, reached Yalta about 5 a.m. and lay there till 8. It's a very beautiful place, and I was told that the drive thence to Sevastopol along the coast traverses scenery so fair that it has been called the earthly paradise. At 1.30 p.m. we reached Sevastopol, where the American left the steamer. The harbor struck me as very fine, but I, ignorant of things military, should never have guessed that the place would be a position of such remarkable strength. On the following morning, Saturday the 6th of October, we reached Odessa before 7 a.m. There was no customs examination as we came from a Russian port and I drove straight to the Hotel de Europe thinking that my troubles were over and that from this point onwards all would be plain sailing. Here, however, I was greatly out of my reckoning, as will shortly appear. For while I was visiting an English ship owner to whom I had a letter of introduction, he inquired whether I had had my passport visa for departure from Russia. I replied that I had not, as I was unaware that it was necessary. Then, said he, you had best get it done at once, if you wish to leave this evening. Give it to me, and I will send a man with it to your hotel, that your landlord may see to it. I did so, and sat chatting there for another quarter of an hour, when we were interrupted by a telephonic message informing me that my presence was necessary. The landlord met me at the hotel door. I am afraid you'll not be able to get your visit today, said he, for it is past noon, and if the police grant it, it will only be as an act of grace. Your only chance is to take a cab, drive direct to the police station, and request the prefect as a favor to visa your passport, explaining to him that you have but just arrived and wish to start tonight. Fruitless errand to seek such grace from the Russian police. Whether I offended them by omitting to remove my hat on entering the office I know not, probably this had something to do with it, for a man cried out at me in anger through a pigeonhole and was only quieted when I uncovered my head. Then it was some time before I could find anyone who spoke anything but Russian, but at last I was shown into an inner room where two men sat at a table, one portly, irascible, and clad in uniform, the other thin, white-haired, smooth-shaven, and sinister of countenance. I presented my passport and explained in French the reasons which had prevented me from coming sooner, adding that I should feel deeply obliged if they would grant me the visa. The wizen-faced man answered in a high, peevish voice, in very bad French, that I must come tomorrow. I cannot come tomorrow, I replied, for I must leave tonight. You cannot leave tonight, he retorted, as his portly colleague threw the passport back to me across the table. If you wished to leave tonight, you should have come earlier. But I tell you that I only arrived this morning, I answered. Then you must stay till tomorrow, they answered. And when I would have remonstrated, 
Go, shouted the man in the uniform. You waste our time and yours. And so, gulping down my anger and pocketing my passport, I left the office. Here was a pleasant state of things. I was in hot haste to get back to England. I had travelled as fast as I could from the Persian capital, not even stopping at Tiflis, where I would gladly have spent a day, and now there seemed ever a likelihood of my being detained in this detestable Odessa for the whim of a Russian prefect of police. I asked my friend, the ship owner, what I should do. I am afraid, said he, that you can do nothing now. You seem to have offended the susceptibilities of the police in some way, and they will certainly not do anything to accommodate you, for their will is absolute and argument is useless. A judicious bribe might have smoothed matters over if you had known how to give it and to whom, but I fear that the time for that has passed. Are you sure the passport needs a visa at all? I inquired, remembering that the words bon pour se rendre en Angleterre par voie de la Russie had been inscribed on it at the English embassy after it had received the Russian visa at Tehran. My friend was at first inclined to maintain that the visa was indispensable, but I asked why, as I was not stopping even a single night at Odessa, and as I was traveling straight through Russia as fast as possible, it should need a visa here more than at Baku or any other town through which I had passed. Then he called a clerk more experienced in the ways of Russia than himself and asked his opinion. The clerk finally gave it at his decision that the passport was good without the visa of the Odessa police unless the latter, apprehending my departure, should telegraph to the frontier stations not to let me pass. Well, said I, the practical point is this. Would you advise me to take this evening's train or not? I hardly like to advise you, replied my friend, but if I were in your place, I should go and risk it. In that case, I rejoined after a moment's reflection, I'll go. I had some difficulty with the hotel keeper ere he would consent to my departure, but at length, to my great relief, I found myself with a ticket for Berlin in my pocket, ensconced in a compartment of the 7.40 p.m. train for the West. A pleasant and kindly Austrian, who was returning to Vienna, and who would therefore bear me company as far as Oshvienci, was my fellow traveller. He spoke English well and gave me much seasonable help both at the Russian and the Austrian frontiers. It was an anxious moment for me when, about 9 a.m. on the following day, Sunday the 7th of October, the train steamed into the Russian frontier station of Wolochesky and we were bidden to alight for the inspection of passports. A peremptory official collected these and disappeared with them into an office, while we waited anxiously outside. Presently he appeared with a handful of them and began to call out the names of the possessors, each of whom, as his name was called, stepped forward and claimed his passport. I waited anxiously, for mine was not there. The official retired to his office and again emerged with another sheaf of papers, and still I waited in vain till all but one or two of the passports had been returned to their owners. Haven't you got your passport yet? inquired the kindly Austrian. The train is just going to start. I don't know what has become of it, I answered despairingly, making sure that my detention had been resolved upon. Thereupon he stepped forward and addressed the official, who in reply produced two or three passports, amongst which I recognized my own. I was very near trying to snatch it out of his hand, but luckily 
I restrained myself. That's mine, I exclaimed. The Austrian translated what I had said to the official, who, after staring at me for a moment, threw the precious document to me. He was surprised, said the Austrian, to see so vast a collection of strange visits and inscriptions on the papers of a young man like you. So much time had been consumed thus that I had to forgo all hope of breakfast, and thought myself fortunate in finding a few moments to change my Russian into Austrian money. Then I re-entered the train, and indescribable was my satisfaction when we steamed out of the station and left Russia behind us. The people I doubt not are honest and kindly folk, but the system of police supervision and constant restraint which prevails is to an Englishman and used to such interference well nigh intolerable. I had suffered more annoyance during the few days of my passage through Russian territory than during all the rest of my journey. Not yet, however, were my troubles over. Five minutes after leaving Wolochesky, the train pulls up at the Austrian frontier station of Pod Wolochesky for the Austrian customs examination. As it began to slacken speed, my Austrian friend asked me whether I anticipated any trouble there. I answered in the negative. What, for instance, said he, have you in that wooden box? The box in question contained a handsome silver coffee service of Persian workmanship, which a Persian gentleman, to whom I was under great obligation, had asked me to convey for him to one of his friends in England. I told my Austrian fellow traveller this, whereupon he exclaimed, A silver coffee service! You'll have trouble enough with it, or I'm much mistaken. Why do you not know that the custom house regulations in Austria as to the importation of silver are more stringent? You'll be lucky if they do not confiscate it and melt it down. I was greatly disquieted at this information, for I felt myself bound in honor to convey the silver entrusted to me safely to its destination, and I asked my companion what I had best do. Well, he said, you must declare it at once on your arrival and demand to have it sealed up for transmission to the Persian frontier station of Oshwechin. I'll give you what help I can. I had another bad time at Pod Wolochesky, but at length, thanks to the good offices of my fellow traveler, the box containing the silver was sealed up with leaden seals, and registered through to Oshwechin. All my luggage was subjected to an exhaustive examination, and everything of which the use was not perfectly apparent, such as my medicine chest and the Wallace valise, was placed in the contraband parcel, for which I had to pay a considerable additional sum for registration. All this took time, and here, too, I had to abandon all idea of breakfast. By the time we reached Lumberg, at about 2 p.m., I was extremely hungry, having had practically nothing to eat since leaving Odessa on the previous evening, and I was glad to secure a luncheon basket, the contents of which I had plenty of time to consume, ere we reached the next station, where it was removed. My original intention was to stay the night at Krakow, as I found that I should gain nothing by pushing on to the Oshwechin, but now, seeing that the bundle containing the silver entrusted to my care must go through to the frontier, and anticipating further troubles at the Russian custom house, I changed my plan and on arriving at Krakow, alighted from the train, reclaimed that portion of my luggage registered from Odessa, and re-registered it to Oshwechi, the Prussian frontier station, and the point where 
the Vienna and Berlin lines diverge. I had just time to effect this ere the train started again. At 11.30 on the night of this miserable day, the train stopped at Oshwichi, and I emerged into the black wet night, the cheerlessness of which was revealed rather than mitigated by a few feeble oil lamps. With some difficulty I found the porter, for the place seemed wrapped in slumber, who, making me leave all my luggage in a locked room to await the customs examination on the morrow, and suffering me to retain only my greatcoat, led me through a perfect sea of mud to the miserable hotel opposite the station. There was a light in one of the windows, but though we knocked vigorously for some time, no one came. At last the door was opened on a chain by a most ill-looking fellow, clad in a night shirt and trousers, with a beard of two days' growth on his ugly chin. So little did I like his looks, that I did not press for admission which he on his part showed no inclination to grant me. So I returned to the empty waiting room of the station with its dimly lighted beer, smoke-laden atmosphere, thinking that after all I should not be much worse off sleeping on the wooden beach which run round the walls than in some of the Turkish stables and Mazandaran hovels, to which I had become inured in the course of my travels. I do not think that the porter who accompanied me spoke German very fluently, and as I could hardly speak it at all, communication was difficult. Tired out, wet, and discouraged, I was anxious to throw myself on the bench and forget my troubles in sleep. Yet still the porter stood by me, striving, as I supposed, to express his regret at my being compelled to pass so uncomfortable a night. So I roused myself, and as well as I could, told him that it was really of no consequence, since I had passed many a good night in quarters no more luxurious. This will do very well till the morning, I concluded, as I again threw myself down on the bench, thinking of that favorite aphorism of the Persians under such circumstances as those in which I found myself. After all, it is for one night, not a thousand. It might do very well, explained the porter, if you could stop here, but you cannot. We are going to shut up the station. I again sprung to my feet. I can't spend the night walking about in the rain, I remonstrated, and you see that the hotel will not admit me. Where am I to go? Ah, uh, that's just the question, retorted he. We again emerged on to the platform, and my porter took counsel with some other station officials. But from the way they shook their heads and shrugged their shoulders, I inferred that my chances of being allowed to remain there were but small. Finally, a gendarme with a gun and bayonet appeared, and I was invited to follow him, which I did pathetically without the least idea as to whither we were bound. Tramping after my guide through dark muddy lanes, I presently found myself at the door of a house, where the gendarme bade me wait for a minute while he entered. Presently, after much wrangling in Polish, he again emerged and beckoned to me to follow him. We passed through an outer bedroom where several persons were sleeping and entered a smaller inner room containing two beds, occupied by the owner of the house and his son. Between the former and my guide, a further alteration ensued, and it seemed as though here also I was to find no rest. At last, the owner of the house got out of bed, 
led me to a sort of window looking into an adjacent room which i had not hitherto noticed and pointing to a mass of human beings vagrants i suppose sleeping huddled together on the floor remarked that it was pretty full in there i stepped back in consternation well continued he will you stay i must stay somewhere i replied i'm not allowed to stop in the railway station i can't get into the hotel and you can hardly expect me to spend the night out of doors in the rain well you can sleep on that bench said he pointing to one which stood by the wall i signified assent and as the gendarme prepared to depart i offered him a small silver coin which looked like a sixpence the effect was most happy it had never occurred to me that these people would suppose me to be absolutely impecunious but i fancy that this was the case and that i did not sufficiently realize how shabby my appearance was in the old travelled stained clothes which i wore at all events the production of this little piece of silver acted like magic my host after asking the gendarme to let him look at it turned to me with a marked increase of courtesy and asked me whether i would like a bolster laid on the bench and some blankets wherewith to cover myself i replied that i should and ventured to suggest that if he had any bread in the house i should be glad of some as i was ravenously hungry cheese he inquired i eagerly assented and further asked for water instead of which he brought me milk i made a hearty meal while his little son who had been awakened by the noise sat up and began to question me in bad french which as it appeared he was learning at school altogether i fared much better than i had expected and had it not been that my socks and boots were wet through i should have been sufficiently comfortable in the morning they gave me breakfast made me inscribe my name in a book kept for that purpose were delighted to find that i had a passport and thankfully received the few shillings i gave them then the porter of the previous night returned to conduct me to the railway station and i bade farewell to my entertainers not knowing to this day whether or no i had passed that night under the sheltering roof of a polish casual ward by reaching the station an hour before the departure of my train which started from krakow where i had intended to spend the previous night i hoped to get my luggage cleared at the custom house and the silver plate sealed up again for transmission through germany in good time here again i was foiled however for i found that the custom house officers did not put in appearance till the arrival of the train when they did come they were intelligent and courteous enough but very rigorous in their examination of my luggage about my opium pipe the nature of which greatly to their credit i thought they at once recognized they were especially curious then they must see the silver coffee service at the beauty of which they uttered guttural ejaculations of admiration but when it came to the question of sealing it up again for transmission to the dutch frontier they declared that there was not sufficient time before the departure of the train and that i should have to wait till the next which did not start till the afternoon or evening i was so heartily sick of oshwechi and so eager to get to the end of my journey that i could not face the prospect of further delay especially as i had every reason to expect that i should have another similar experience at a dutch frontier so i inquired whether it would not be possible to have the package forwarded after me to england 
they replied that it would and introduced to me an honest looking man named arnold haber who they said was an agent for the transmission of goods to him therefore i confided the care of my precious but troublesome little box which dearly wished me some days after my return to cambridge with a heavy charge for duty from the dover custom house it was with unalloyed satisfaction that i took my seat in the train and about ten a m left oshwechim behind me at two p m i reached breslin where i had just time for a hasty meal and at ten p m i was at berlin just in time to see the flushing night mail which i had hoped to catch steam out of the station so here i had to spend the night at a homely comfortable hotel called the berliner hof the luxuries of which a remembrance of my last night's discomfort enabled me to appreciate to the full next morning tuesday the ninth of october i left berlin at seven forty five a m for flushing and twenty-four hours later without further adventure landed once more in england by half past nine on the morning of that day wednesday the tenth of october i was at king's cross debating in my mind whether i should go straight to the north or whether i ought first to visit cambridge where term had just begun to report my arrival and request a week's leave to visit my home this indecision however was of brief duration for my eagerness to see my home again would brook no delay and increased nearness did but beget greater impatience there are i supposed few pleasures in this world comparable to the return to a home one loves after a long absence abroad and the realization of this pleasure i could not bring myself to postpone for a moment longer than necessary thus ended a journey to which though fraught with fatigues and discomforts and not wholly free from occasional vexations i look back with almost unmixed satisfaction for such fatigues and discomforts and they were far fewer than might reasonably have been expected i was amply compensated by an enlarged knowledge and experience and a rich store of pleasant memories which would have been cheaply purchased even at a higher price for without toil and fatigue can nothing be accomplished even as an arab poet has said وَمَنْ طَلَبَ الْأُولَى مِنْ غَيْرِي كَدِّي أَذَاعَ الْأَمْرَ فِي طَلَبِ الْمُحَلِّ And he who hopes to scale the heights without enduring pain and toil and strife but wastes his life in idle quest and vain. End of chapter 18 Section 46 End of a year amongst the Persians Impressions as to the life, character, and thought of the people of Persia received during twelve months' residence in that country in the years 1887 and 1888 by Edward Granville Brown